Maybe we've been together. We have the children, and I still love you. I'm so crazy enough to since the first day I saw you. From the U.S. to Africa, baby, here we are. Everything that we've been through, all the lessons we learned to. Let's share it all and talk it with the top us. Hello and welcome. In today's episode, we're going to talk about preventing or fighting child abuse. It's no secret that many children face different types of abuse, such as sexual abuse and gender-based violence. It is sad and honestly disgusting that men and women who should be protecting little children are abusing them and using them for their own pleasure and to get out their anger. Today, we will hear from a brave young lady, Maseho Sibunga, who has sadly experienced this abuse. This is not going to be easy for her, but our hope and our prayer is that as she shares, many will be encouraged, and that many will also start speaking out. Part of the reason why this, this topic or this issue of abuse continues on and on is because sadly in our culture, we tend to shy away from those things that don't make our family look good. What ends up happening is that our children then live alone and carry this huge burden of this abuse which is not good. At this point, we're going to introduce our guest, Maseho, who's joining us virtually. Hello, everyone. My name is Maseho, and I am a writer and a spoken word artist. I also do other things as well, like studying, and I also work in mental health. So today, I'm going to talk to you about my childhood. So this is not an easy thing for me to talk about, but I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to talk about it because I know that there are so many young girls and boys who are hurting. So um, this is my story. My history of sexual abuse started when I was very young, about a year and a half. Now, I don't have a memory of that story, of that happening to me but I heard from my mother that there was already evidence from just in my neighbors that someone was violating me. My earliest memory was when I was about five. I was home alone with this person and I was just playing outside, just like kids do. And he called me inside the house and I still have vivid memories of that incident. And the crazy thing is that it didn't just stop there and it continued for years and years. And I remember just wishing someone could see that something was happening to me, that there was something wrong that was being done to me. And as a child, I couldn't even make friends because I felt like I had to keep this to myself. There was like so much shame, which wasn't even mine to carry, which was even mine to bear. And I remember that there were like so many signs that something wrong was happening to me because I wasn't just a normal child as well. I used to cry a lot for no reason at all. I could be at school and just cry. Um, I could be just sitting and just cry. But at that point, I couldn't say why I was crying. I wanted to tell someone, but I just didn't have the words to say it. And the thing is, in our culture, there's some things that you're not supposed to talk about as a kid. And it was really, really hard because it's not something that's been spoken about. When I was a teenager, I, I was just tired. I constantly 
felt dirty inside. And I just didn't want to leave in the body that was being used like that. I didn't want to leave anymore. So I wanted to kill myself. I shouldn't be here talking to you today, but thank God, none of my plans worked. So one, one other thing that I remember um, when I was a child is that there was just evidence that something traumatic was happening to me, but people around me used to just say, like they would assume that I had a disability of sort because I wasn't functioning like a normal child. I was just too forgetful. I would zone out. You would like send me to a room to do something and I would zone out and forget what I was there to do. I couldn't do simple tasks that I should have been able to do as a child. If you leave me sitting here, you could come back three hours later and I'll still be sitting here. That's not something that a normal child does. And so people around me just assumed that I must have had a disability. And that made me believe that something was wrong with me. And that made me think that all those things were happening to me just because something was wrong with me. So if I'm the problem, then how do I ask for help if I believe that I'm the problem? At some point, I had to go to God and ask him to help me, which was something that I really didn't want to do because I was angry at God. I wished I wasn't born. I didn't commit any crimes. So I was angry at God because I felt like he allowed this to happen to me. And when I went to him, I was like, God, here's my heart. I'm hurting and I'm angry and I don't know what to do. Because one moment I think I'm okay, I'm motivated. And the next moment I don't want to be here. I'm thinking of the, the fastest thing I can get myself out of this world. So that's how my journey of healing began. And God provided peace. He provided understanding. He provided people who came in and they loved me and they held my hand as I walked this journey of healing because we need people, we do. To everyone who's been abused before, to every child who's hurting or being hurt, I may be the first person to say this to you that I believe you and it is wrong and it is not your fault. And I believe that there is hope. I'm on a journey of healing and I can promise you that I'm not where I used to be. And to parents, let's, let's pay attention and let's believe our kids. And if your child comes to you with a story like this, take them out of that situation first because it's not easy to live your life feeling dead on the inside. Thank you. Welcome back. Did you report it to the police or you just got healed by the, the grace of God only and you left the issue for God's intervention? It's not something that's easy to go and talk about. So no, I haven't been to the police. And I think the crazy thing is I'm not alone. Almost every girl that I know in Botswana has been violated sexually at some point. I don't know if people understand what it's like to go and say, this happened to me and have it being speculated. And I think she's bringing up a good point that at this current point, it's so hard. Maseho and I have talked about this because I've known Maseho for, for a long time. And one of the things she was saying is, if they can't take me out that day that I go and report it, 
I'm not going to go report it because then the abuse is going to be even worse the next night. And so it becomes very difficult for our young women and men, for that matter, to say what's happening to them because unless they can know, be assured that that's it, once they go and speak truth, they're rescued, which that's usually not the case, then the pain that they're going to feel at home is way more scary than going to the police. So we've got to find ways. I don't know what the solution is, but somehow we have to find solutions or otherwise like she said, she knows so many people that have suffered the same thing and they don't know how to ask for help because it's too scary to ask for help. Just to add to that, um, you know, in our culture, uh, you can talk about your private parts. You know, they are, as a matter of fact, if you use the word for, you know, for those private parts, it's an insult. So how do you then get into honest conversations about things that are happening to you? How do we then help our children to say, if somebody touches you here, you know, there's your private part to our children. But a lot of children don't have that freedom. If that is not voiced out, these little children, remember, they depend on our protection. And so if we're not giving them that freedom to express themselves and to feel protected, they are never going to do it because they know the system is set up for them to fail. At least if they can't go to the law, if they cannot go to the police, at least in our churches, we must have systems where these children are able to come to us and safely speak to somebody. What is it that you can advise young women, um, even mothers and fathers, what is it that we can do to try and look out in our little children, both boys and girls. What can we look for to find out if they are being abused or not? I think we need to acknowledge our own pain and try to seek healing for that so that when someone comes to us for help, we are not looking at them through the lens of our own pain or we are not pushing them away to avoid them triggering our own hurt. Um, secondly, I would say that let's have authentic, real relationships with our children so that they know that if someone does something to me, I can always go to my mom. I can always go to my dad. They are the person that I can go to and they will keep me safe. I feel like we need to find a way to reach out to people hurting kids to just say, stop, because Sometimes you can do all that you can possibly do and something can still happen because they are, there's bad people existing in our communities. You know, one of the things that Maseho and I have discussed as we talked about this over the years is that um, the role of the mother and the grandmother. Do you want to speak to that role? Because we've talked about that. The people that violated me were like these relatives, old men that my grandmother took in to come and stay with us. And... There's like so much of that happening where kid, where parents leave their kids with like their own mothers and that person is tired. They have to do a lot of things and they are like 12 kids in the house or they are seven kids in the house. They don't have the time or the energy to pay attention to one kid. So a lot of these things, they can go on happening and it can be unnoticed. And because I remember that I felt that what was happening to me happened in place in plain sight. And I remember it happening to some of my cousins as well. It can look like it's love. Like, oh, that's, that's your favorite um, cousin or that's your favorite little nephew or that's your favorite little niece. But we need to be careful of those them. So when you go and say, this person hurt me, they'll be like, no, no one loves you more than that person. So to the mothers out there, I would just ask you to examine your heart. What is the reason why your child is not living with you? When Maseha and I talked, she was saying, I would have rather lived in a one-room house, which was safe, than to be in a place where maybe it was deemed more comfortable, but less safe. Fathers, what is the reason you're not protecting your little girl? Why are you not home protecting her every night? That's your job, to take care of them. And so our culture needs to stop glorifying just sending our kids to live with other people. At this point, let me just be transparent, that we have realized that our son is now living with my parents in America. And the reason why is because we know that that's a safe environment and because he had some medical issues that he was genuinely better off being in America with my parents. 
So there are times when the situation you're in, it is genuinely not the best situation. But a lot of times, if we're honest, it's because the kids are inconvenient and because we're selfish. But then what's happening is because of us trying to protect ourselves, we're putting our children into a place to be violated when we should be the ones protecting them. Assess the situation. I mean, if it makes sense and you know they will be safe, okay, that's fine. You know, you take the child to the grandmother or other relatives. But if you're looking at the situation, you see, I am just overwhelming this poor old lady who should also be resting and enjoying her life then please let's try and make the best decisions for these children. You don't want your child to have to carry that, that kind of burden for the rest of their life. It is very unfair. What can we look for so that we can help to intervene and uh, put an end to their suffering? So sometimes they can be withdrawn. Um, they can be too secretive for a child. And there, there are some things as well, like they can't even like hold their own pee. Some kids become hypersexual. Like you, you'd see that, no, this child is acting out of the ordinary. A child shouldn't be that sexual. Um, another thing is some kids act out. You may think that they are rude or they are, because they are trying to tell you something, but they don't have the words to say it. So they are doing something that gets your attention because in their own brain, at least maybe whatever action that they are doing would bring your attention to what's happening to them because they don't have the words to say it. And sometimes for those who don't show the signs, I think it can just go to as far as them just telling you that, you know what, this thing happened. They may not show the signs, but if they tell you that this thing happened, please believe them. Welcome back. What do you advise the little girl that is out there going through what you went through? How do you advise them to reach out? I want to emphasize on the fact that it's not your fault and it's not your shame to carry. Because in most cases, that's what keep kids from talking about it. You do not have to be ashamed. Something wrong is being done to you. And you can open up, tell someone, tell your teacher, um, tell your mother, tell your grandmother, tell someone. And now there's like things like Muzwana women, I've seen that on Facebook, um, that just came to my mind. There's like people who write stories, you can write there anonymously and there can be people who can genuinely reach out to you and help you if at home you can't get that kind of help. Can you tell us what other tools do you use on this journey of healing? I am going through therapy. So the thing is, I was born in a Christian home. So I use the word of God to affirm myself. I go to the Bible to look for my identity in the, world of, in the word of God. And I've surrounded myself with people who are positive and they understand me. So you're going to need people who can walk this with you and people who are healthy for you. And there's the word of God as well. And I go to therapy as well. One of the things that just really touched me, one time when Maseho and I were talking about this, when she was talking about tools that she uses, is she said, you know, one day I just was looking around and I saw everything in the planet has a purpose and I am not any different. And I just thought that was so profound that just because someone has hurt you doesn't take away your divine purpose because it's a mental battle. It becomes a mental battle. And so every time that you feel accused and you feel condemned, you're able to go to the word of God, which is full of life and hope and say, there is now therefore no condemnation in Christ. You are loved. You are valuable. You are worth it. And I am so thankful that Maseho has learned that tool. And I would encourage you at home that I know some people might say they're Christians, and those are the very people that are hurting you. But please don't let those people stop you from going to the God who created you and loves you so much that he died for you. As sick as it is what you're going through, I can promise you that somehow God can walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. What do you think 
causes a person to become an abuser in your own understanding? In season one, we did a show on substance abuse and there was a police officer in the room. And one of the things that he said, which I thought was very profound, is when they were interviewing and talking to um, prisoners, both men and women who had hurt people, that one of the things they said is, what does it matter? It's not like anybody cares. You know, it's like after a while when people neglect you and they ignore you and they're mean to you and they abuse you, you get to the point where you have to either get hurt every day or you have to become dead on the inside. You have to become so cold that you don't care anymore if you hurt anybody else because people hurt me so I can hurt you because that's just what world is all about. And so one of the things I think in, in dealing with breaking the cycle is not just dealing with the person that's been hurt, but the perpetrators that continue to hurt people. And it doesn't help to just tell them, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, because they don't care. Because somebody hurt them and they didn't care. So we have to love them and be kind to them and be there for them and to respond to their violence and their rudeness with just persistent love. And I think if we could each one identify one or two people that we can just love and be kind to, we have no idea the difference we could make. If we can try and strengthen the family, if we can be healthy as a family, one family at a time, that's where it starts. Instead of protecting that uncle, that brother, that father, that stepfather. Call them out. Call them out. Report Talk them to the police. about it. Talk about it as a family. Report them to the authorities. I just want to also humbly ask the people who should be protecting these children to examine their life and think, what is keeping me away from my child? Is it alcohol? Is it sleeping with other people? Is it whatever, working hard? Whatever it is, can I tell you that that thing that you're doing will never fill the void like just loving your child. There's just something so fulfilling about sacrificing yourself to love another person. And so I know that probably you're doing this to seek some kind of fulfillment that you don't feel because someone has hurt you. But can I just ask you just to stop, seek help and try to just say, you know what? Nobody did this for me, but I'm gonna do this for my child. I'm gonna stop sleeping around. I'm gonna stop working so hard. I'm gonna start drinking. I'm just gonna be there tonight. I'm just gonna go home and say, let's eat dinner as a family. Let's talk tonight. Let's make it stop tonight. It's not gonna happen overnight. They're not gonna believe that you changed overnight, but do it again tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow until the child starts to say, has my parents changed? Do I matter? Am I worthy of their time now? And slowly you begin to get to heal that child by just your presence and your love. What exactly uh, can be done to help uh, a boy child as well concerning this problem that you are facing? What I've been saying also apply to boys as well. Like people always think that if a child is a boy, they should have enjoyed it. Like, oh, I wish I, I, I know some men who would like comment, especially on social media. When a man says that I was violated as a child, they were like, oh, you're so lucky. I wish I was violated. No. They are not lucky. They were not supposed to be violated. And that was very, very wrong. Don't just pay attention to girls. Pay attention to boys as well, because it can equally happen to both genders. Do you hate the person who abused you or have you forgiven them? Um, I would say that forgiveness is a journey. Growing up, I always had thoughts of killing men who've abused me. I've always, I carried this anger. I always thought about killing people constantly. And I was like, my goal was to grow up and go and just kill everyone. Yeah, that was my, my mind as a child. But then I realized that carrying bitterness only hurts me, not that person. And sometimes a person will never come back to you and say they are sorry. You are going to have to forgive and let go for yourself so that you can heal. Because I wasn't going to start the journey of healing while I'm still holding on to the grudge. Yes, some days I wake up and I'm angry and I'm angry at the world and a part of me just hates all men. I have to remind myself that, you know what? That person did not do that to you. There's that person who did that to you. And this anger that you're carrying is only hurting you. This bitterness is only hurting you. Now you've closed yourself. You can't even make friends. You can't even form healthy relationships because of what that person did to you. And when it's too hard, I'll come to God and say, God, this is how I'm feeling today. And I don't know how I'm going to work it out. I don't know if it's going to go on for a day or two minutes, but please 
help me get through it in a healthy way that I don't have to come back to this very place again. As we close today, I wish you could have been here with us in the studio audience. It was a very touching story. But the number one thing I hope you have gotten from this is that each one of us have a part to play. So can I just encourage us at the end of this all is to start being more concerned with the innocent children than the protection of the leaders of our society or the parents or the elders or whoever it is that's hurting. Because really, one of the best things we could do for them is to stop them from hurting others. Put them in jail in a place where they can be apart from these people and then start the process of healing with them as well. Because one thing we've got to understand is that everyone in this cycle is hurting. And somehow we've got to stop the cycle of abuse, which is destroying our nation.